Well, hello and welcome to the 40 days of waiting small groups. Now, why 40 days of waiting? You know, in past years, we've had 40 days of grace and 40 days of prayer and 40 days in the word. And these all feel like really positive things, whereas waiting is more of a negative. And the reason we wanted to do that this year is just to recognize the reality of the situation we're in. You know, we didn't just want to uh, be as though this virus crisis isn't continuing uh, just overlook it uh, and be in any kind of arm reality, but recognize that all of our lives at the moment are on hold. Um, in our house, for example, Jono is expecting to go to university this year, our youngest son. He can't do that now, so that's on hold. Uh, and there's this tension and suspension of all of our lives. All our plans have had to change, and who enjoys that? Well, <laughs> we don't. We, When we make plans, it's really disruptive for us, for those to change. It's a trial. You know, this having to wait is a trial for us. But the thing is, the Bible has things to tell us about trials. So I want to look at one passage this evening uh, and we'll unfold it. And it's uh, in the book of James. It's the letter that he wrote, first chapter. And apart from verse one, where he basically just says, hello, this is the first thing he says. So I guess what he considered the most important part of his message. Here's what he says. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be mature and complete, needing nothing. Now, I just want to take a few minutes to look at three words in here. Opportunity, joy and maturity. And we'll see what God has to say to us first opportunity and you remember this passage began when troubles of any kind come your way consider it an opportunity for great joy now that's a very countercultural way to respond isn't it you would think for most people when troubles come of course there's there's a kind of a pushback and an anger and you might think that a good way to respond is a sort of eastern religion all uh, this too shall pass that kind of idea but what james is calling us to is much more positive not just to cope with the situation, but to exploit it, to make use of it, to seize the present time. You know, when we talk about waiting, it isn't just a matter of sit and do nothing until whatever it is comes about. On Sunday, Tim talks about how we feel that waiting is a waste of time. And I really liked that. It's a very resonant phrase. It's very realistic. And if all we do is wait, then actually it is a waste of time. But the real question for us is, what do we do while we're waiting? And God's call for us every day is to seize the day that we're in. Sometimes that means a chance comes along to do something. We can grab that chance. At the moment, in this strange season of our lives, it almost means the opportunity to do nothing. To step back, to wind down the activity, to spend time with God himself and also with the people that we know and love in our families. So there's an opportunity, although we've lost a lot of things because of the current situation, actually we've gained something as well. Now here's the second thing, the word joy. James writes, remember, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Uh, and this is another thing where as we read it, probably our immediate thoughts are, well, does that make any sense? How can troubles be an opportunity for joy? And what I want to draw your attention to is that he doesn't say happiness but joy. And those are two rather different things. I would say that happiness is based on our circumstances. So when you go on a, a nice holiday or when you eat a nice meal, those things make you happy. But joy is something that's seated more deeply. It's got a more solid foundation. I think joy is something that grows from inside us, whereas happiness perhaps comes from things that are outside us. Here's what David says in Psalm 32. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt and whose lives are lived in complete honesty. So joy, in the Bible conception of it at least, is something that is found when people know and love God and know that he loves them. Think about People in terrible situations, much worse than us. Think about slaves in America before the Civil War, in the most appalling circumstances, and yet the songs of joy that arose from those people. 
Uh, joy is not from circumstances, but from the work of God in our hearts. And the third and last word that I want to look at is maturity. Do you remember at the end of that passage in James, he says, when your endurance is fully developed, you will be mature and complete, needing nothing. Now, why is that such a big deal? Why do we care so much about being mature? Why is that such an important goal? Well, I just want to read you a very short passage from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, describing what that's like. He says, we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Now, maturity in this passage is two things, at least. One of them is stability, that we're not just knocked off course every time something goes wrong. It's developing a robustness. But it's more than that, isn't it? Because Paul talks about the full and complete standard of Christ. Now, again, what this is about is knowing God. It's so much more than just a mental resilience. It's knowing the God who made us and who loves us. Now, that is the most fundamental challenge for us as the virus crisis drags on as the thing that we maybe thought would last a month or two is now looking like it's going to be a matter of years. The challenge is how do we use the time when we're waiting? And the challenge is to use it to come to know God better. Not just to know more about him, as valuable as that is, but to know him. And that's the challenge in these 40 days of waiting and in as many more months of waiting as there may end up being to know him.